Ross, it's been a couple of years since you've been with us here in Whitstable and a lot has happened in the interim period, not least, I have to say, the ballads of uh, Peckham Rye. You must be really pleased with the response to, to the album. Hello, hello, hello. It's been extraordinary, yeah. It's been a, a roller coaster of the last two years. It doesn't seem like two years since last I was here, I guess, because we've been so busy and I have one of my fondest memories of touring here, opening for uh, Mary Coughlin and having dinner with Mary and her band and yeah. uh, and things just went from there I think it was prior to releasing the album we were here and it's been great they've sucked us into the UK circuit and we haven't stopped touring since really yeah and uh, the icing on the cake must have been the nomination for Scottish Album of the of the Year yeah um, I mean for me look I've never been cool and I've never been good looking so I've never been that attractive to labels and the labels mm. that I've worked with I haven't really got on very well with <laughs> either. So uh, when I went to record the second record, I went to Arts Council in England and said, this is my project, this is what I'd mm -hmm. like to do, and I was blessed with with our support. Um, bear in mind that everyone else that was kind of nominated for uh, this award, we're talking about people like King Creasel, we're talking about people like uh, Paolo Nartini, these people have got massive media spend, mm -hmm. fair play to them, I actually have a great fan of both the acts, but to me, for me, someone like me with no media spend, and really it's about building relationships with people in the industry, it, it's a massive thing because what it meant was practically is that I had my record up and down the land in, in HMV sitting on shelves with the other the other nominees. And anyone that tells you that they're not interested in that stuff is, is lying or they're fooling themselves because mm. it was, a, it was, it was a, a great privilege. Yeah. Um, you mentioned support of the um, Arts Council. How does that work? There's bodies like uh, Factor in Canada, uh, where they go along with an, almost like a, a business plan for mm -hmm. wanting to make an album. And there's going to be so much Canadian involvement mm -hmm. in that album, or whether it's touring or something like yeah. that. Was it v similar with how you had to approach? And was yeah. it a bit of a lottery whether you then got it or not? Well, it was similar, um, and and luckily I had uh, I had the, the assistance of a friend who has experience in fundraising and someone mm. who speaks um, fundraising parlance, which is half the battle. You need to demonstrate that you're going you're gonna to deliver value for money. It's going to be both creative and economic benefit uh, to the country. So yeah. if you're putting together a plan for touring, you need to demonstrate that you're not just going to Manchester and London, you're also going to you know, Preston and, and Whitstable. Yeah. And I was happy to do that because you know, I, lo I love playing. And from then... They, they showed me that they had faith in me uh, they, they invested in the project and and actually the money that I put into that allowed me to of course team up with great musicians but then it the money that I made from selling the record is enabling me to go and record the next record too yeah so it's like it's a leg it's a real legacy thing yeah, yeah. and that's when things change really yeah. for me well it effectively becomes an investment for the Arts Council in you yeah. because you then generate economy around you by employing other people yeah yeah, yeah that's that's the way they look at it yeah. yeah you know I was whistling in the dark for years and years and years in London and it felt like being brought in from the cold yeah really and from then things have just got much better well the last time you were here was uh, off the back of uh, North 10 now both North 10 and Ballas of Peckham Rye you've co-produced what do you get from bringing someone else into the project and firing off them I often go f to the example of uh, well, Stevie Wonder, but then also Sufi and Stevens. I think you know both are tremendous artists, and and both of them, over the course of careers, their careers have struggled to know how to finish a song. Yeah. And sometimes you need a, a strong person in the studio to say, well, actually, perhaps that's a bit navel gazing, mm. that's a bit self indulgent. Maybe we could try a different way. The co-producer on on ballads and. And, uh, and North 10 was a guy called Alex Pilkington who uh, is quite an inspirational character he's a, a really good friend he has a, a long history in the in the industry and he comes at it from his musical tastes are different to mine so he brings mm. something totally different and something very techy as well that I totally lack I'm not really interested in mm. twiddling knobs and, and, and that sort of techy side of things um my great fear really is getting lost up my own arse, to be honest. So it's good to have, to, you know, it's yeah. good to have someone yeah. to run ideas past. Yeah. You know, there have been several musicians that have played on both those albums. One that I must pick up on is obviously Danny Thompson. Big Danny. You just see that name, and it conjures up so many things. I mean, how how did he come on board? How did you approach? Him? Well, it's a beautiful story, really. I, when I was a 
in my early 20s, I was living in Edinburgh and uh, I was living in, in not particularly nice cir circumstances, to be honest. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I'd left school without any qualifications and there was a real sort of poverty of aspiration where I grew up and I didn't know what to do with my life and the one thing that I'd always wanted to do was listen to music and people asked me why I became a musician and the truth is because I didn't want to get a real job and mm. um, that's still, still the truth today. I fell in love with the music of John Martin and uh, he and Danny famously would fall out you know, perennially and they, they got together for this, this tour called the Sunshine Boys Tour and it was the first time they'd been together touring for about 10-15 years. Yeah. Six of us got in my Ford Fiesta and drove through from Edinburgh to Glasgow and it was just the most magical kind of spiritual evening in this beautiful little theatre in Glasgow. John and Danny, it was I think the second night of their tour so John hadn't had too much of an opportunity to be on the lash you know it was still mm -hmm. it was still new to them and they were telling old anecdotes and you could see the laughter and the love between the two of them and it made me want to to be a musician to move to London uh, you know I had an experience of going to London when growing up and London always represented opportunity to me mm -hmm. you know, something so I did you know kind of a year later a whole team of us uprooted and moved to London caused proceeded to cause about a, a decade's worth of chaos and bedlam on the open mic circuit and the, the kind of indie gig scene. Yeah. Um, so then, fast forward to, I signed this little deal, this deal with this little record company called Hoham Records, who are a South East London label, and um, Mark Tucker, who was the engineer in the project, uh, had recorded with many people, but he had recorded on a project with Danny a, a number of times. He was really good friends with Danny. And I had said, I've got this guy who, who I want to come in and play double bass. And he said, well, how much? And I told him the fee. And he said, well, look, to be honest, if you want to get double bassist, then really there's only one guy for it. And he said, Danny Thompson. And I thought he was joking. Two months later, I'm in the studio in North London, and this guy, this bear of a man, is sitting in front of me. Uh, and I was totally in awe of it. I, I don't mind saying, you know, I was totally starstruck, totally in awe of him. And since then, we we've just become really good friends. I love him like a brother. Really, he's a really special guy to me. He's endlessly fascinating. He defies sort of any sort of expectation or category. You know, he's played with everyone from Kate Bush to Roy Orbison. Mm. I'm lucky enough that he's just been in to record on my third record. It's been a real dream come true yeah, for me. Yeah. You know, well, Danny is obviously a very large figure, but you've also got some great other players yeah. that have been with you both on the road and on both records. Either consciously or subconsciously, when you know you've got such a good group of players around you, do you think when you're writing now that you've got those players in mind, or are you still very much lyrics and? Melody, and then we'll see where it goes when, we t when I take it to the rest of the band. Generally, it's it's the latter. However, uh, there's a song that I wrote on on ballads called Silent Drums, which I wrote with Danny in mind. Actually, my favourite mm. John John and Danny album is an album called Inside Out. It's just total freak out. You know, John he had a real penchant for jazz, and he he wanted to break out of that standard kind of songs folk song structure. Mm. And I, and I wrote that song with, with having Danny come in but other than that I can't, can't think of another song that I've done that with yeah. people often talk about John Martin in reference to me and, and, I, and I love John's music but I think perhaps my, my greatest influence is, is Van Morrison and um, you know his Caledonian Soul Orchestra mm. you know, Van has whatever you think of the man I've never met him Van has continually surrounded himself with the best musicians yeah. and I think you know I do my best to work with musicians far more competent than I am you know as as much as I can yeah. you know I'm a real jazzer and that's another thing that I love about Danny you know what he brought to Pentangle with Terry Cox was was jazz you know that jazz jazz folk fusion amazing you know that standard mm -hmm. is is what I aspire to well I mentioned earlier on that between your last uh, appearance here at Whistable and now you've done so many other things but one thing I did want to ask you about is the experience of BBC introducing and going to to Nashville mm -hmm. as a songwriter, did Nashville live up to? If you had expectations of it, did it live up to what you wanted it to to be? It was a tornado, man. You know, it was a whirlwind of uh, kind of surprises and and songwriting and 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 we had such a great time. Mm. You know, I got a call to say Ross would like you to go to Nashville. I said yes, without even asking what it was about and. They said, well, actually, you know, Bob Harris would like to take you to perform at BBC Introducing. And, you know, Bob is 
another hero of mine, you know. Mm. And we had such a good time. We met so many people. And since the legacy of that is that people took me more seriously, yeah. actually. You know, it was this... If you've got Bob Harris's thumbs up, it's like a mark of uh, quality, yeah. you know. And, yeah. and all of a sudden, people were, people were calling us and saying, would you like to play this gig? Would you like to do an interview? Things really fell into place after that gig. I think that's perhaps the most important gig that I've done so far. Mm. It was less about what happened there. It was more about going there and saying, well, actually, you know, I've been able to work with these people. Although, on a personal note, going to Nashville was a dream come true. I grew up listening to, in particular, Garth Brooks. You know, I'm a big Garth Brooks mm. fan. And um, I had terrible jet lag when I was there. And I, I got up and ran along the Cumberland River as the sun rose listening to you know Jason Isbell and it's one of my one of my fondest memories actually brilliant yeah well just to wrap things up you have just mentioned uh, that the fact that there is a third album on the way how far along the the line are you with that then do you know what I'm so excited about it and every musician says it I know I'm, I have a, a, a real self-awareness about it everyone says my next album is going to be the best but I really think it's going to be the best we've got um, an amazing jazz pianist called Dave Milligan coming in on, on Monday mm. he's going to come down and play on per, perhaps 90% of the record and then on Tuesday I've got a guy called Colin Steele who I think is for my money the best trumpet player in Scotland he's going to come in and put his mark down then we've got a percussionist on the on the Friday I think that when I when I leave Scotland uh, we'll have had probably 95% of the recording done I've got another three really exciting guests in I can't tell you who they are uh, <laughs> because I, I feel like it'd be tempting fate it's disrespectful yeah. to do that but as soon as they're in once I've got photographic evidence of their recording that will be all over social media I'm really excited because we've got a, a kind of gospel act coming in you know they've performed for President Obama you know it's really really big deal I don't know you know I'm just in a really good creative space at the moment things seem to be working and I'm really excited about how the record's sounding Brilliant. Well, we're very pleased to have you back in Whitstable. Great to be here. And no doubt you'll be booked as soon as that third album comes out as well. <laughs> Ross, thanks very much. Thanks, Neil.